ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride. Welcome to the Evening Standard Rugby Podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. I'm Lawrence Delalio, and I'm joined, as ever, by my very glamorous, lovely co-host, Sarah Elgin. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Lawrence. And with all the negativity in the rugby news, we decided to bring a positive ray of light from the media. So it's the Evening Standard's Steve Cording. Hi, Steve. Good morning, Lawrence. That's the first time I've been called a positive ray of light. I like that. We'll keep that one. That's such a nice introduction. And we Very all nice. actually be on our best behaviour this week. Because I don't want to use your top class barrister, but when he takes charge of Wales against New Zealand on Saturday, he'll become the second match official, only the second match official ever, to referee 100 test games, it's the one and only Wayne Barnes. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'll, ho- I'll hold you to that, staying on your best behaviour, because whenever <laughs> I've been out with you two, that's nothing that I've ever seen before. Well, same can be said for you too, Wayne Barnes. <laughs> exactly. Love it. OK, well, we've got plenty of questions lined up for you, Wayne, that's for sure. But before we get into all of those, I'd like to check in with everybody and see what they've been up to. Um, Lawrence, you took a little trip over to Cheltenham this week, I saw. Um, catch up with a few... Two old rugby friends? I did, yes. Um, I drove down to see Phil Vickery, one of my favourite human beings and uh, and players. He has done very well post-rugby. He obviously won Celebrity Master Chef, and he's got his own restaurant in Cheltenham. Unsurprisingly, it's called Number Three. So we sat down, had a few bottles of wine, bit of a chat. Uh, lovely to see him. And by complete surprise and a coincidence, Rob Henderson was there. Rob Henderson was on best behaviour because uh, he just turned 50, and he's with his lovely wife, Ange, and his three daughters. We sent a nice bottle of something over to him. So great to catch up with Phil. Great to see Rob Henderson. And anyone who's in Cheltenham, do drop in to Number Three. Good. Okay, so you've been enjoying yourself, Lauren. Steve, what have you been up? to you still down in Devon or are you- no no back now no I managed to a couple more days down by the coast but then back up to London and uh, was at Hampton Court this weekend doing the uh, Halloween trail with my little ones which was both spooky and exciting for them at the same time so we've got pumpkins all over the place I love it Wayne um, we saw you in action on Sunday of course at the Saracens um, sale game away from refereeing duties though what else do you like to get up to of a weekend well, Steve um, has touched upon Hampton Court. Uh, the, the kids were over there with Polly, my wife, yesterday. But um, Saturday night with Chiswick House, they've got a kind of a spooky themed house from six o'clock. And you've got one around there. And it's a bit like, I don't know if you've ever been to Kew, the lights around Christmas, which are amazing if you ever get the chance to do those. But they've taken that now to a Halloween feel. And I was petrified, let alone the kids. <laughs> so you've got these kind of, um, you know, actors jumping out from behind gravestones, you know, and it's it's not really what you want is you're trying to stuff an idea. <laughs> it's, it's a great way to prepare for a test match, isn't it? Go down there and be scared to death. I know. <laughs> It was. it was a lot scarier at Chiswick than it was. Oh, no, actually, uh, Principality. That'll, that'll be pretty intimidating. Sarah, why am I with your party? I had a teenage house party on... Oh, the- my word. Yes, um, and it was really good. It went really well. And I really enjoyed, like, decorating the place. I was told not to over-decorate it, so I didn't. But we did the whole pumpkin thing as well. We put pumpkins everywhere. But, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, really, really a lot of fun. OK, so we're going to be chatting through the weekend's rugby action a little bit later on. Uh, but first, Wayne, we're going to put some questions to you. Don't forget, you can also watch the full extended video podcast at londonpridebeer.co.uk. Please drink responsibly. Wayne, there's no doubt you're a man at the very top of his game. Sarah mentioned earlier, you know, a well-deserved spotlight on you this week. We saw the piece in the Sunday Times ahead of officiating your 100th test match, equaling Nigel Owen's achievement. Uh, And then, of course, you'll make history the week after becoming the most capped test referee of all time when you oversee the game between France and South Africa. That'll be tasty. (laughs) That'll be a tasty one for you. Um, You've had a phenomenal career. You've outlasted us all. Obviously, um, you know, Polly Barnes is the real secret to your success. But, I mean, you've done what 265 or so premiership games what keeps you going because I thought when after Japan 2019 I, I thought you might sort of turn your attentions back towards your your legal career rather than carrying on refereeing what keeps me going um the team around me um they're a good bunch I really enjoy working with them I enjoy getting into Twickenham every Monday Tuesday I like the international boys and girls at the moment I think we're a good bunch we socialize well together we have a lot of fun together they're all coming up next weekend and 
I'd imagine there'll be some fun had in the week after my 100th test, if I know some of them, what they've got planned. Um, and I enjoy that. And, you know, there's still some things that I want to do. You know, I'm still refereeing pretty well. I have to work hard at my fitness. <laughs> That gets harder, as you know, and so you have to look after yourself a little bit more. I was up doing my Pilates at 6.30 this morning um, and then sitting on a bike trying to get the legs flush so I can do all the running sessions for the week. But, you know, I still want to be involved in those big European matches, you know, and now with South Africa coming in, the South African teams, I want to be involved in the Stormers against Claremont or, you know, the Sharks against Bordeaux, all of those games that, you know, are still um, fantastic. I want to be involved in World Cups. And if I go to the next World Cup, that'll be my fifth. No one else has done that. And, and if you get to referee the World Cup final, that'll be your first World Cup final as well, I would imagine, as a referee. And obviously, there's always that sort of, do I want to see England win the World Cup? Well, you've already seen that. So you don't, but would I like to referee? <laughs> Would I like to referee a World Cup final? The answer is we'd love to see you referee a World Cup final as well. So, you know, there is that challenge as well, isn't there? But one thing I can't control is that. What I can do is keep trying to get a bit better. And if England are in the World Cup final, I'll tell you what, I'll be there. I'll be cheering. I'll be in the Stade de France cheering with them. And look, I know that England being successful does a lot more for Tellington Rugby Club and a lot more for Bream Rugby Club back in the Forest of Dean. It gets people talking about our sport. You know, if England aren't there and then I put myself in a good enough position, well, we'll see. But I've just got to keep refereeing these two games well because they're going to be two difficult games over the next couple of weekends. Yeah, Wayne, how do you cope personally with the psychology of what you do? I mean, what you do is a fantastically difficult job. I love the addition of the microphones because I feel now as a viewer of the game, you know, RefLink was superb. You get to follow what's happening. You understand what's happening a lot more. Uh, Your commentary as you're going through just is perfect for it. But I mean, how do you process it yourself? Because there's so many eyeballs on you as the man in the middle. I've got some really good people around me whose opinions I trust. Lawrence knows one of them really well in Phil Keith Roach, my scrummage coach. If he's telling me I'm refereeing a scrum like a, a plonker, then I'm refereeing a scrum like a plonker. If someone on social media wants to tell me I'm refereeing a scrum like a plonker and Phil Keith Roach, who coached England in the 2003 World Cup, says, you're refereeing it well, carry on. I know I'm going to listen to the same as, you know, I've got um, ex-international kind of coach helping me prepare games. I've got ex-international referees. I've got sports psychologists. I've got a, a little team around me who just help me to make sure that I don't listen to those external noises. There's a lot of people who want to tell you how to do your job, whether you're a player, you're a coach, you're an official. Trust the people around you, the ones who really matter, and you won't go far wrong. And Barnsley, you talked about some of your mentors, Chris White, Tony Spreadbury, maybe even Ed Morrison. What is it about the West Country that seems to uh, seems to bring out the best in all of you guys and you end up becoming referees? Because there is a real hardcore of top-class referees that have all originated from the West Country. Well, people probably don't understand our accents. Now, I, I know I've got my slightly posher London one now, but after a couple of pints of scrumpy cider, um, <laughs> I'll slip back into Spreaders. I think um, with Spreaders, everyone just thought he was insane. Anyone who refers to himself in the third person during a match, you know, running around saying Spreaders, <laughs> um, you do you do think, well, uh, maybe I'm not going to argue with him today because you know, it's quite, always quite always quite comforting having a paramedic on the field. Actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, like Whitey and I, obviously from Gloucestershire, Ed, Ed and Spreaders, Somerset, Bristol, but there's a lot of good rugby down that way at the junior level. I remember, you know, first game I ever refereed was between Bream Thirds and Burial Whoppers, which was um, a Forest of Dean derby. You know, my first three seasons when I started off, you know, you got a couple of quid travelling expenses, you got a couple of free pints. So I did something like 160, 170 games in my first three seasons. So all of a sudden, you've got this wealth of experience, you know, to get you up and running. So um, I I think there's something about that rugby that was down there and you know that it's it's a hotbed of rugby what's the best and worst thing about being a referee i mean i guess you you'll be selfless and say the best thing is if no one mentions my name after the game really and but i mean what are the best and worst things about it easy worse to travel being away from home now i used to love it when i was you know start my first trip away 2006 fiji you know down to new zealand up to japan love it you know i was making sure i was a single man i was just trying to do that so. <laughs> <laughs> I was a single man then. <laughs> um, it was wonderful. You had no responsibilities at home. Yeah. Um, and so I loved, loved the travelling. First time you go to New Zealand, first time you go to South Africa, you know, and then you get to go to, you know, some places you'd never go to before. That was amazing. 
now the most difficult thing is the travel because you know you're four weeks away from home in um i was in the summer down in um, the island new zealand tests i um, mean you're four weeks away from your family you're four weeks away from your friends and you want to spend more time at home and i think the other difficult thing is the uncertainty of travel and uncertainty of game so you probably know from a tv point of view where you might be for the next eight nine ten twelve weeks teams know they're home on this weekend they're away next weekend but i don't know from a premiership point of view until the monday where i'm traveling and that could be a friday Saturday, or sunday so your, your mates ring up and say do you want to come out for dinner on friday night or do you want to come around to our house on Saturday, and the answer is always, I don't know. So it's uh, not you just being difficult. You just, it, it's just, I, I don't I, genuinely don't know. Exactly, and like Six Nations, you know, you'll have a rough idea and um, which Six Nations you'll be involved with. I don't know if I'm involved in the Six Nations yet, and if I, I do, I don't know which ones. And so that ability to plan, you know, that's what I'll, I won't miss. But you know, the positives is the travel, <laughs> you know, seeing these amazing places. I was, I popped up to Fiji during that New Zealand Ireland game. It's amazing country, amazing people. And Barnsley, you're, I mean, obviously the game has changed so dramatically and so m- much over the last few years. You talked about you've got a scrum coach, Phil Keith Roach, best in the world. What's the hardest part of the game to referee? I think the breakdown is is extremely tough because of the quickness. And so you get someone like, take yesterday's game, Benner, or gets on the ball so quickly. And you've got to be able to see whether or not he's come off the player and the ball and come back onto the ball. And you get a, you know, a split second to do that. And so that's a big challenge. But also, you're not just watching him in in those situations you're seeing is that everyone rolled out the way where have players come from they come from their own goal line that they squared up all of those bits which make the breakdown difficult what i find when i step up into the international game sometimes is becomes slightly easier because the players referee that breakdown for you because they arrive there in numbers they arrive there at pace they arrive there with venom to move their opponents and that's why you really recognize those fantastic back row players of you know McCall of Hooper of Pocock and um, because they managed to still either beat the the first man there and get that win that shoulder race or they were talking five years ago when we used to talk about surviving the clean they would hold on they would just kind of ride that kind of clear out so I think the breakdown is still the toughest area and because there's 250 odd a game so you can't switch off The scrums, I spent a shed load working on because they can drag the game down, you know, because if you have 15 scrums in a game, you know, I think there are only nine or 10 yesterday. Scrums are great yesterday, by the way. You know, everyone was scrummaging high. It's a really good competition. But if you get a load of scrums which fall on the floor, it saps the life out of the game. So I want to make decisions. I want to add continuity. And so when I make a decision, I want to make it with, you know, really strong knowledge. And that's why, you know, Roachie and I'll sit down on, I think we're sitting down Wednesday to have a look at the Welsh and the New Zealanders to see, OK, what do they look like in this strong position, what do they look like in, when they get beaten, what do they look like when they get caught. And so, you know, I always enjoy those. I'm sore by the end of those sessions because, you know, what he's like he'll be he'll be scrummaging me around some coffee shop or some wine bar in town. Oh, and really? like, <laughs> Way Lawrence tried to tell us last week that he's never had a red card in his career, which I've looked through the record books and I, he's right. Actually, I can't find one. But you refereed his last ever game, Premiership final. What was Lawrence like to referee as a as a player? Remember, I caught him at probably the tail end of his career, but I remember that game, the the 08 final, lol, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, that game in itself, the people who were playing. So you were captain against Corey, yeah. um, and then you had, I think. There was a shed load of superstars who were playing that game. Well, I'm going to say Andy Good uh, as well because he, I think he played at ten. He got he dropped the goal in the semi final to get you through. But you had like Tom Reese still playing. It was just a a, a real competitor. That was my first final. So all of a sudden you're this I don't know 27, 28 year old, not even trying to deal with these big personalities on the pitch, but just to let them get on with it. And it was one of those cracking finals. I remember, I think what was nice and the respect that you probably had, Lawrence, is you went off at about 60, 65 I minutes. I think you said to me, you're off, mate. And I thought, that's very strange. So I was sending me off. And then I turned yeah. around and you went, no, no, you're actually off. And there yeah. was a weird thing because you'd given us a penalty and Van Gisbergen was just about to line it up. And it was a bit of an odd moment, really. We ended up shaking hands on the field uh, yeah. and then you go on off you go off you go yeah. well um what was and i think again just showing like the relationship between refs and players dave pearson was my reserve ref that day and he said look barnsey they're doing number eight sub and i can't remember who came on he says but you'll want to take a moment for this so he knew about you know this was your last game 
and it was it was nice because the crowd acknowledged what you know you'd done to the game and um, and we stopped and even the Leicester players you know clapped and I just saw that sell a lot about our game it again showed that relation you know and I remember you you know shaking my hand I think you squeezed it quite hard at that point <laughs> uh, but, uh, Barnsley, we're winning exactly <laughs> that is exactly what you said I mean look I, I used to always go and make a point of having a chat with the officials not just because I was captain after you know after the game right you everyone wants to chat to the officials before and during the game but after the game you know and there's always two emotions you know you either win or you lose and you don't win every game but always wanted to go and have a chat to the officials and we, we used to be able to buy you a pint in those days do you still have a chat with the players after the game or is it or does that not happen so much yeah still one of my favorite well a couple of favorite memories around you know some european games and some international games after the bill bow final when um leinster beat Racing, i was refereeing we, we sat down in the change room post match just sitting there and our you know our little team having a beer a little knock on the door and donica ryan comes in with a crate full of beer under his arms sat down with us still in his kit um and sits and has a beer and shares you know tells us about the game and how we felt it went and as we're halfway through that beer, there's a knock on the door and Tyg Furlong comes in. Leinster prop sits there, great beer. And so all of a sudden you're sitting there and you've got players for the winning and losing team having a chat about the game. You're like, yeah, I, I quite like this game. <laughs> I think this game is pretty good. And like one of my favourite memories after the, what could have been, you know, I, you know, I always kind of review after each World Cup, how long have I got left? Have I got another couple of years left? But after the, um, the third, fourth playoff between New Zealand and um, Wales, so repeat of this weekend, um, we were leaving the changing room a good hour after the match had finished. And as we're leaving the changing room, Steve Hansen and, and Warren Gatland are coming up from the Wales changing room with a few of their coaches behind us. And um, and Steve says, you know, what are you doing heading into town? We'll drop our bags. He said, well, you're very welcome to come and have a, a beer with us in the changing room. So my little group of officials went in and uh, had a beer. And it was the last game for the likes of Kieran Reid. I think um could have been Comrade's last game as well, all sitting in there. And sharing a beer and looking around, thinking there's some very talented players. You know, Alan Wynn had come in and um, Ken Owens are all in there. You know, those types of players who you enjoy. And you're not just talking about the game, you're talking about life in general. And um, there are still those wonderful bits of rugby. I could sit and listen to you talk for hours. Wayne, because there's so much there's so many questions we want to ask you and stuff, but we're going to have to move on, gents. Time for us to chat through the weekend's games now. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Friday night saw the Exeter Chiefs arrive at Kingston to take on Gloucester. Of course, Cherry and Whites were first on the scoreboard after Lewis Rees Samet, who had an amazing night, went over after just three minutes of the game. It was all looking fairly even at halftime, just two points in it, but then Gloucester ran away with it a little bit in the end, I guess, going six tries to Exeter's three. Steve, for a neutral, it was a compelling 80 minutes and a great watch. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was right across that back line, Gloucester. It's not classic Gloucester, is it, anymore? I mean, you look at the form that Adam Hastings is in and you've got Carreras playing well as, as well and who knows where he'll play for Argentina at the weekend because he's so capable of playing in any different position. But I, I looked at the tackle count as well, which was 170 Gloucester against uh, 64 for Exeter. So it just shows that they were putting in the defensive effort as well at the same time. And you now look at their record and they've only lost one game Gloucester in the Premiership and that was to Saracens in injury time. So they're definitely the real deal and will be pushing, I think, for the title. The one note of optimism, I think, for Exeter was the performance of Scott Seo, who looked everything you'd expect him to be. And I think he's going to make a massive contribution for the Chiefs for the rest of the season. Well, how different a side are Gloucester this season? Because they have been making progress, haven't they, under just giving 10 and Last season, Exeter did the double over them. So for them to put on a performance like that was impressive. It was. I think George Stevenson said that was his most complete performance of the season because a lot of their games have gone down to the last few minutes because of their game management necessarily. And I think what would have pleased him most is the variety that they have in their game. We know about their driving more. We know about their forward play. But actually, their outside backs were very much part of the game. And a lot for Gloucester fans to be happy about. Yeah, absolutely. Um a lot for London Irish fans not to be happy about um, this weekend, or to be frustrated about, maybe, I should say. Um, you were down the soup for Quinns against London Irish. Lawrence, exercise, they kind of looked to be in control, didn't they, in the first half? Quinns came back fighting with about 10 minutes to go, was looking all square. Then Irish edged ahead, thanks to a penalty. And we all thought 
They've got it. They're finally going to win a tight game, but it was rather controversial end to the game, I guess you could say, and then Quinns came out on top. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, Quinns don't do anything other than the, the the dramatic. It was a fascinating contest. A few international players away, but a really strong Quinns lineup. And given the performance that they put in against Sale the week before, everyone kind of thought that it was a home banker, really. And, and Irish played superbly well. And then there was a whole sort of flurry of cards. A couple of reds, one on each side. A couple of yellows, one on each side. So the game had pretty much everything. Quinns, of course, came all the way back and, you know, late drama, um, as you said, it, that, I mean, we've got to go straight to, to where the game was won and lost. You know, Esther Hazen's throw over the top of his head and Van Rensburg, who was outstanding throughout the game, going up in the air with Charlie Matthews. And the referee and TMO had a lot of good communication throughout the game. And unfortunately, I mean, everyone will have their opinion, depending on which team you support. Or, But I think they got the wrong decision. I hope I'm not going to get into any trouble for saying that, but I genuinely believe that. I've made mistakes as a player that have cost us the game. Welsh supporters will remember my horrendous decision to kick for the corner and not for goal in 99. Everyone makes mistakes and referees make them occasionally as well. So, uh, I mean, Barnsley, obviously, because you guys haven't done your collective review, you probably haven't arrived at any any sort of point of view on that. I mean, how does that get kind of looked at in, in your kind of reviews? Do you, I mean, is there, does everyone have their opinion or, or does Paul Hull maybe just ask one of you to give us what you think is the right opinion? No, and, and I think that's the strength of our group at the moment is that we've got the ability all to challenge each other so if you've got this group of you know really I think talented refs we'll sit in a room and we'll discuss it and we'll agree and we'll disagree on some some are easier to agree on and it's interesting Lawrence you say you know you watch it live well, but what's your view on it now? Well, my view on it now is that, is that both players were going up for the ball and they both got their eyes on the ball but one player catches it a split second before the other player, which which didn't look to be the case in real time. And when I looked at it again, whether his eyes were on the ball or not, his, his left arm plays the right shoulder of the, of the player who catches the ball. I mean, I think it was accidental, but, you know, if you look at the outcome, the player then falls on his back, his head then whiplashes on the floor. And um, yeah, so I do think it was a penalty, maybe a card, but uh, I, I certainly don't think it was play on, that's for sure. So you've explained it really well, actually, um, what we're looking for. So we've got to decide whether or not they're in a realistic position to contest for that ball. The interesting thing about that one is it's an odd piece of play. It's not a box kick where two players jump up. It's a bloke being bundled into touch, flips the ball over the head and two players jump for it. So that you've got that kind of odd scenario. And it's just whether or not you think at that point when they're right next to the ball, they're both in a realistic position to contest the ball. I, obviously your opinion. And I think, you know, the majority of what I've read over the weekend seems to be down that view. But interesting yesterday to speak to some of the coaches who were at Saras and Sales, some of them thought it was a fair contest. And then I've spoken to a couple of other journalists who totally um, agreed with the decision and its play on. So, Wayne, how honest, how honest are you as referees, like in terms of each other's performances? Well, I think the people who are the most brutally honest person on any review tends to be the referee themselves. You know, we really do scrutinise our performance and we will be the first ones to say not good enough. Like I've already spoken to Chris White and Spreaders, who still keeps an eye on me, even though he's now head of European referee. And like in jest, yes, I got bumped, but that's not good enough. I stopped the game twice yesterday. You know, that that's me. That game could have carried on. And we all talk about flowing games and how we want the game, you know, to have that momentum. By me getting in the way twice, I stopped the game. That's that's not good enough. So I, I want to be better. I want to move better. I want to make sure that you don't get caught between three players, particularly because it bloody hurts. So we're our biggest critics. But because we see each other every week, you, you know what it's like, Lawrence. Um, when you have a team who've been together for so long and know each other and trust each other and socialise with each other and take the pee out of each other, then you're willing to open up. And that's where we're really lucky in, in the premiership at the moment. And, you know, also internationally, um, we're a group now who have been together for a long time. Everyone knows that, you know, myself and Nigel kind of came through the ranks together, but Joubert was kind of part of that group as well. Like we would sit down and we'd have really robust discussions and, you know, we would disagree, but we felt comfortable. And I think that's where we are as a premiership group. And I don't know what we'll come up with, but what we'll also do if we say, well, it should have been a penalty. Paul will pick up the phone to Declan and say, look, this is what we've come up with as a group. That doesn't make things better because if it is a penalty, if it's not a penalty, you know, of course, they're going to be disappointed. But I think as long as you can have that honest debate with a team, there's been times this this year in half a dozen games I've done in the premiership where, 
you speak to the director of rugby afterwards and just say, look, I got it wrong. I just didn't see it like that. There was a player in my way or I was distracted. When I get a decision wrong, I don't mean to do it. I get it wrong. And so you just try and get better. And I think that's what's great about rugby is that you can have those grown up conversations. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Official beer of Premiership Rugby. Okay, so meanwhile then, over in Franklin's Gardens, Northampton Saints bag themselves a win over Bristol Bears, scoring maximum points in the process. Entertaining game, Steve. Plenty of tries, including two for our former podcast guest, Alex Mitchell. Yes, friend of the show, Alex Mitchell. Uh, he's certainly bounced back from being left out of the uh, the England uh, Autumn Internationals. Um, two fantastic tries, set up another one. And I think his combination with Finn Smith already looks looks a good one. I just wanted to give an extra mention as well to Aaron Hinckley, who came in. Superb performance at open side. Spoke after the game about wanting to have more of an opportunity to play. Obviously, with the internationals being away, he's got a chance now. You know, he made 30 metres made, 18 tackles, was all over the pitch. And I think that's something that's very heartening for them. But for Bristol, oh dear. I mean, I I played back (laughs) the episode that we had when they were played to one two and Alice Genge was on fire and we were lauding them and and now it's lost four in a row not one for five weeks and and next weekend they've got Saracens so I mean Pat Lamb was after the game was bemoaning the amount of mistakes that they made and they just didn't seem to be able to keep hold of the ball in the second half it was knock on after knock on so a little bit of work for Pat to do ahead of uh, next weekend I think so on to Sunday then, where two teams at the top of the table were battling out as Sale Sharks paid a visit to uh, Saracens. Wayne, your referee in that game, <laughs> you kind of ended up in the thick of the action, didn't you? A little bit more probably than you would have liked to. That's the pitfalls of the job though, right? Happens sometimes. Well, it's also getting in an average position, isn't it? And getting in the bloody way, which, um, you know, once is all right and everyone has a chuckle. By the second time, I think I was swearing at myself. So, um First of all, it's, it's great to, to see kind of Alex Good um, kind of receive the kind of uh, ovation and the warmth from the, from the crowd. You know, I don't know how many games, but you know, I think more than all of us put together currently in the Premiership. Just an amazing <laughs> achievement. He's just a generally good bloke as well. You know, and he always plays with a smile on his face. And you know, straight at the final whistle, he came over and had a chat. And he's just a decent bloke. And you know, he played well yesterday, didn't he? You know, he moved to from 15 to 10 pretty early on when uh, Van. Polo left at 10, um, but just showed that, you know, range of his ability, not only those counter-attacks, those rangy runs that he scored from, but also then just to read a game. And he actually put in some decent kind of tackles as well. You know, everyone went looking for him when he went to 10, but he didn't shirk anything. So, you know, just think that speaks volumes of him and as a bloke, but also the game, you know, it was one versus two. And um, it, I, I really enjoyed the game. It was physical, what you expected from these two teams. It was tactical with a box kicking, but then with, a, you know, looking for a bit of whip when you, when you can. Scrums was a good contest. Driving more, you know, Sale got on top at the driving more. Scored a couple of tries from that. But the breakdown, you know, you had Ben Curry, you had Ben Earl, you know, both, you know, some fantastic sevens, Jackson Ray uh, making an appearance at eight. So that breakdown was, you know, from a refereeing point of view, really uh, difficult there. Uh, to kind of referee, but really added value to the game. So we had turnovers left, right and centre, counter-attacks. And I watched it back last night when I got home um, and um, thoroughly enjoyed watching it back again. Wayne, we need you on every week. That's some <laughs> amazing, impressive analysis. Yeah. Better than anything that we ever do. <laughs> well, you never know when I'll be looking for a job, Steve. So, uh, you know, come post-2023, let's have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> do you always look back? Do you look back at every game? way that you do you have to I guess do you in terms of yeah so we we all get in as I think you all know Monday and Tuesday all the uh, professional referees in England get together in Twickenham and I want to have seen the game uh, before you know we step into that room and start discussing them so you know what the key areas are we'll do what we call a a hot debrief you know something we picked up a lot of the teams do it but uh, from the Marines actually we did a load of training with the Marines in the lead up to 2015 they talk about that immediacy of review and I really like that because you feel kind of whether it's anger or disappointment or you know kind of you really understand how you felt during those moments so we'll have a quick shower in the change room at that amazing Stonex Stadium and um, have a quick chat around what were the big moments what things we need to review you know what decisions do we think we uh, we might have got right or wrong you know only two three minutes and then we know what I'm looking at coming to the review so I'll do the full review last night in time for um, about an hour's time um, this afternoon. 
Super quick, sorry. You trained with the Marines before 2015. Nigel Owens didn't do that, did he? <laughs> I think I was carrying Nigel on my, you know, like you usually yeah. carry a backpack on these 10 mile hikes. I think I was carrying Nigel across these. <laughs> I think you might have been. I think you might have been. Uh, and, and bless the TMO, sir, honestly. The, the TMO <laughs> probably walked to get a coffee uh, most mornings, but they haven't, they haven't gone over a scramble net. You know, I think you've been down there, Lawrence, down in Limston yeah. there. And they're bloody impressive individuals. And Jens, there's been some positive news, finally, this week uh, in terms of Wasps and Worcester and their futures. How excited should their fans be with that news, Lawrence? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's been all doom and gloom, hasn't it, recently? I mean, both sets of fans haven't had much to be happy about or to smile about. They're, both teams have been relegated and suspended from the premiership but uh, what happens in in this process is obviously both clubs have gone into administration and slowly but surely the first steps on the road to recovery have been taken by both parties the administrator uh, has to find an interested party and a suitable interested party so all I will say is that the you know the brands the IP the logos whatever you want to call it of both clubs have been assigned to another interested party for a fee And that will then allow those parties to go off and come up with a business plan, a proposal to move their club forward in the championship. There is a number of hoops to jump through in terms of the RFU's fit and proper test. But the long and short of it, Sarah, is that, yes, it is a a positive step forward for Worcester. Uh, I understand the statement yesterday was that Jim O'Toole, the former CEO of the consortium that he's heading up, um, and not the one that Steve Diamond is heading up, has been successful in securing the future of Worcester Warriors. And with Wasps, we don't know quite as much about it, but uh, apparently it does include some former Wasp players. So I love that line. We don't know that much about it. (laughs) If only we had a Wasp, former Wasp legend, or a current Wasp legend. I guess you're always a Wasp legend, aren't you? You on the podcast. No, we are, we're, you know, we're, there's no conflict of interest on this show. We are in completely impartial. And it's, listen, it's good news for Wasp fans and Worcester fans. But, uh, you know, there's a long, long, long way to go. I feel like you're looking a bit more positive this week, though. Yeah, we are. And there's, there is things to be positive about. I mean, not the way that those two clubs have been treated by the rest of rugby, essentially. But uh, we will discuss that on another pod. But I think, you know, the brand of rugby that's being played, the Women's World Cup is, you know, England, the Red Roses are going well. Stadiums are being sold out. So, yeah, there is a lot to be positive about. And um, from my perspective, very sad to see what's happened to Wasps. I've, re- I've written about it, so I don't need to talk about it. But um yeah, anyone who knows myself and, and Wasps as a club knows that that's not the last you've heard of uh, of Wasps, that's for sure. OK, should we do Outstanding then? Outstanding. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Lawrence, you can go first this week. Who gets your vote for Outstanding Player? Well, there's a number of candidates, but uh, I'm going to focus on the Saints game. I thought uh, Saints-Bristol. I think for me, Aaron Hinckley is a really wonderful story. He was outstanding in the game itself, but he was a player that was, um, I think he started at Gloucester's Academy. He ended up getting cut from that and he was at Exeter. He was sort of yo-yoed up and down at Exeter and they cut him and ended up having a trial at Northampton Saints. And I understand He's just signed a long-term contract. So I love a story like that because I think it's, it just shows that, you know, no matter who rejects you or or what happens, you've got some real resilience. And in the game, you can see why he signed a long-term contract because he, he was outstanding, you know, work rate, tackles, everything. Didn't get on the score sheet, but Aaron Hinckley, number seven for Northampton Saints, was my outstanding player of the week. Steve, who are you going for? I'm going for the man with the longest name in the Premiership. He was on the losing side, so it's not often you pick a player from the losing team, but it was the controversial ending that we've already discussed. So I'm going to have to read this one out because it's very long. Barend Johannes Jansi van Rensburg. Imagine trying to put all of that on the back of his shirt or for Wayne Barnes to actually write it down in his little notebook. That would take forever. But he was superb. Um, I think he's the heartbeat of that Irish team, an Irish team which is not a one and five team. 16 tackles, two turnovers made. Obviously knocked out at the end of the game in the uh, controversial circumstances. But I think if it hadn't been for that, if Harlequins hadn't won, he would have been man of the match. Have a guess who I'm going for? Uh, Lewis Reed Zammett. Yes. God, yeah. What did you guess? <laughs> yeah, look, Austin did say, didn't he, that you know, he has the potential to be one of the best wingers we've ever seen. And he's only 21. So he's got so much time so much rugby hopefully ahead of him but I just like the way that he kind of he's kind of 
at such a young age, you know, who's dropped, wasn't he, by Wales when Pivot told him to go back to his club and just work on the areas of the game that he needed to work on. And I just think he has done that. He's shown maturity in doing that. And he gave a great post-match interview, which always helps. My decision, I find, in the outstanding player. So, um, yeah, he's got it for me. He's got some outstanding quads on him as well, isn't he? I, don't know what, I, don't know what, I mean, they, they are the shiniest quads I've ever seen. And <laughs> do you know what? The game does need superstars. And he is already a superstar of the game. And he's very good. Very, very good player. We like him. Uh, Wayne, I'm assuming you might go for someone from your own game. Um, I think we've already mentioned him on, on the wrap-up and it'd be hard to look beyond him after his you know, 795th uh, appearance. He's not only you know been a, an amazing servant for Saris, but I think he's he's been a great man for the game. So I think Alex Gu, pretty easy kind of um, outstanding player of not just the weekend, but of you know perhaps uh, the Premiership. Good choice. Very good choice. Okay, let's turn our attention to next weekend then. Um, some quick predictions. Steve, Exeter, they're on the road again. Um, this time they're headed to Northampton. Yeah, tough one this. I'm going to go for Northampton. I think they're now they've showed they can finish their chances playing at home. Alex Mitchell, friend of the show, on fire. Yeah, Northampton home win. Sale, they'll be welcoming Gloucester Lawrence. That's going to be an intriguing one, actually, isn't it? Looking forward to that. Yeah, it is. Gloucester, I think, had their Scottish and Welsh internationals available. They won't have that next weekend. So no Chris Harris defensively, no Lewis Rees Zamet in an attacking sense. And Sale coming off the back of a defeat. I thought they were unlucky in parts against Harrison's. They had a moment in that game where I thought they, they could have gone on to win it, but they didn't. And as a result, I think that they will be wanting to get back to winning ways. I can see Sale winning that match. At Wayne, Newcastle, they're back in action and they host Bath. You know, as a referee, I could probably tell you to score, but probably be inappropriate, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but what they both do is they try and put some wits on the ball, don't they? Uh, Newcastle, I was up there a couple of weeks ago against um, Saris, and Saris were really impressive that day. But yeah, they'll be um, at least they'll put some wits on it. Bath are using their driving more pretty well at the moment. I think it'll be Bath driving more against the width of Newcastle. So you're not telling me who you think's going to win. <laughs> It's <laughs> so hard to predict, isn't it, at the moment? <laughs> OK, we'll move on then. I'm not going to put you in that position, Wayne Barnes. Um, Bristol Bears, we'll be going into battle. I guess the only unbeaten team this season, Saracens, come to town. Who's going to answer this one for me? It seems to be a, a tough prospect for Pat Lamb's side, this one, guys. Yeah, I think it does. But bizarrely, just when you think you could predict the results, Saracens unbeaten. They haven't got the galaxy of players, but they've got so many others that keep stepping up. I think the benefit that Saracens have got is that Eddie Jones has invested a lot of time in certain players and then decided that he doesn't want them anymore. Ben Earl, Alex Good, there's a the list goes on and on. And I think that obviously, you know, it's unfortunate for them, but Saracens are the main beneficiaries. Bristol, they need a big performance. You know, everyone has a little run of games. Northampton Saints have had a run of games and then suddenly they pull that one out of the bag at the weekend. And maybe maybe it's Bristol's turn, you know, to beat Sarri. So I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if Bristol finds something. I'd be having, as I said, a little word with some of their senior players and saying you're earning a lot of money, chaps, but you're not really putting much back into your bank account here. So uh, we need a deposit from each and every one of you. <laughs> um, another massive game taking place next weekend that we've got to talk about is the Women's Rugby World Cup semi-final. England will be up against Canada. And of course, you watch the Red Roses all the very best for that game. Is there only going to be one team, really, that we need to talk about here, gents? Yeah, we, we had, uh, obviously, Marley came on, didn't she? Marley Packer scored a hat-trick you know, against Australia in awful conditions at the weekend. But um, I think it's all been pointing towards that England-New Zealand final. The French might have something to say about that, potentially, but um, I think that's it's heading that way. It'll be another early start for everybody. Set your alarms to get up and watch it, but no... I think we'll hopefully all the best to the Red Roses, but hopefully we'll see them in the final. Um, and then, of course, the Autumn International Series also kicks off next weekend. So, Wayne, if you could just tell us who's going to win that battle between New Zealand and Wales, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine? I predicted the score and got, and got it spot on. Just give us a spread. Well, I'm a bribery and corruption lawyer, as you know. So, you know... The... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone seems to be taking New Zealand down to the wire these days. So, Sarah, I'm sure Wales can keep the result going until at least the last few minutes of the game. Wouldn't that be good, eh? Wouldn't that be good? OK, for now, though, time for us to turn our attention back to our guest, solely on you, Wayne Barnes. Um, are you ready to get tackled by Lawrence Delalio? Sounds good to me. Tackled. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. 
Okay, Barnsley, here we go. Um, thank you for being our guest. What is your full name, please? Not as impressive as yours, Lawrence. My name is Wayne Barnes. They argue too much, my parents, about the name Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Favourite takeaway? I would imagine you have a few. Being the athlete I am, um, there, no, there's a, there's a nice little uh, Indian around the corner. Regal Spice on Twickenham Green. Love a little bit of a, um, a Balti or a Pathia. You can get a free one now. Good plug. <laughs> uh, celebrity crush. Um, are you allowed to divulge your celebrity crush? Or well, growing up, everyone used to watch Funhouse and Martin and Mal, didn't they? <laughs> the, the twins, you know. Yeah, I, I guess those two would be my, you know, kind of my childhood crush. That will do. Um, uh, other than reviewing your, your your own performance, what was the last movie you watched? Oh, we're currently going back through all the Star Wars ones because we haven't seen them for an age. So um, Phantom Menace was the last one we watched last weekend. And what does a referee have for breakfast on the morning of a test match? Oh, um, depends who's making it, but it'll be down in um, Wales this weekend. So <laughs> I'd imagine it'll be a, a fry up. A bowl of porridge and a, a, some banana on top. Give me some energy to get me legs running. You want Brilliant. to try a bit of Welsh rare bit then? No? Yeah. Oh, oh, maybe the night before, Steve. <laughs> What's uh, Barnsley? I mean, I think I've just said it, Barnsley. Uh, what is your nickname? Is it anything uh, elaborate like Barnsley or, or Wayno or I don't know? <laughs> University nickname was Wurzel because I came from the West Country and right. most of my uh, mates didn't have a great kind of um, imagination. So they nicknamed me <laughs> Wurzel. <laughs> And what's the best uh, piece of advice, maybe from some of your mentors that you've ever been given? Or talk to people as you'd want to be talked to. So, you know, if you're talking to a player, speak with a bit of respect. And then, you know, you can ask players to talk in a similar way. Back. I have to say, I like that. You are... You speak with a lot of empathy on the field. You, you know, you don't shout at players. You just talk to them calmly, which is um, not easy to do in the heat uh, of the battle. I have to say, um, who is the most famous person in your phone book? <laughs> You're looking at yourself there, Lawrence. No, I'm definitely not looking at myself. <laughs> no, question, uh, question. Um, oh well, it's going to have to be um, your captain, mate. It's going to have to be Martin Johnson. CV. Oh, bless him, bless him. Yeah, I, I've, I kept texting some bloke called Wayne Barnes who I thought was Wayne Barnes and he just said to me I'm not Wayne Barnes <laughs> I was going oh, who was it? no that was me Lawrence <laughs> <laughs> it was just Barnes he basically just trying to get rid of me so, you know, there we go um, who would play you in a film about your life? Well, I, I know there'd be loads who I'd want it to be, but Brian Campbell, the um, ex-international referee, is convinced that I am Tintin. He even sent me at one of my birthdays a picture of Tintin with me next next door to each other saying, have you ever seen these two people in the same room? So it would have to be Tintin. That's your new nickname. Surely. So, there you go. Of, of the current group of players, or maybe even past players, who was the funniest player that you refereed on the field? I always used to have a, a, a bit of fun with Andy Goo just because he just looked atrocious towards the end yeah. of his career. And, uh, <laughs> there, there was some times when he was up at Newcastle, you know, crawling around. Like at one point he was stuck on his back like a beetle, you know, couldn't get up and I have to <laughs> help him up. So I always enjoyed him. And um, when he was playing at Worcester with Sean Perry, you had Sean and Andy at nine and ten. and They would make me look extremely slim. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a dog or a cat family? Um, we don't have either, and but th the kids would be desperate for either. But I would be a dog man, and Polly would be a cat woman. But she's yeah. allergic to cats, okay. so we just won't have any animals. If the referees actually referees probably do have to. Sing. What do you have to do when uh, when they when they hit a milestone like a hundred caps? Do you have to sing a song? And if so, what would be your karaoke song? Oh, a uh, karaoke song. I love a karaoke. Um, I used to do Uptown Girl, but Westlife copied it, so I I changed. Then I used to do Mandy by Barry Manilow. Then oh, Wesley ooh. covered it. So now I have um, I went to Copacabana following on the Barry Manilow theme, but no one really knew Copacabana. So my new current one is Whitney Houston, The Greatest Love. Oh, that's um, classic. The old romantic. Very, very good. Who is the best rugby player of all time? And you've refereed everyone. So you've got a hell of a choice. But who's the person that you have always thought, wow, is it a Richie McCaw? Is it a Martin Johnson? I was petrified of Jono to the point where I once apologised to him when I yellow carded him and said, <laughs> sorry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love that. Uh, they're, they're, I think it's always back row which jump out to me um, because you see them kind of up close. So uh, I think McCaw, Pocock, 
you know, between those two, just got themselves in the right position really often. What McCall did as well was when New Zealand were under the pump, the amount of times he would get his hands on the ball and just go up the guts of a game and just take control for that five, ten minutes get his hands on the ball and the opposition. He just seemed to have that extra level to know when he needed to step up his game. So I think those two, you know, those two players, when they played against each other, it was fantastic. Led low cut between Australia and New Zealand with Colin Pocock was pretty amazing. I think that's a pretty good call. Um, now, you've got many of these because you've been refereeing for a very long time, but what would you describe as your proudest premiership moment? How many finals have you refereed, actually? <laughs> I should know that. Um, nine or ten? Wow. Um, wow. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. So the first was your one in, in, in 08. So that was that, that was memorable because it's your first. Um, I thought this the, the one that just gone, Sarah's Leicester, was um, really entertaining. But it, it wasn't your pure, expansive rugby. It was a game of chess. And the, like the finish. Every time I look up at a scoreboard now in the lead up to a game, you're seeing that drop goal. That's pretty impressive. But I remember the Sarah's extra one maybe three, four years ago, 2019, where they came back and they were dead and buried. And then they came back and they played some wonderful rugby. And I think it was 35, 31, something like that. That was a special, special final. Well, Wayne, thank you very much for answering those questions and for being our, our amazing guest on this podcast. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you. And uh, we and everyone uh, across the whole of the world wishes you the very best of luck and congratulations on uh, your 100th test cap. Very much looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much, Wayne. So that's all for this episode of the Evening Standard Rugby podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. And don't forget, you can watch the full video uh, episode of this podcast at londonpridebeer.co.uk. And if you've enjoyed listening, give us a like and make sure you signed up to receive future episodes. And we'll be back next week. Uh, but from now, from Sarah, Steve and myself, thanks for listening and goodbye. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with Pride.